I'm uh, very honored to be here. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. <clears throat> um, it was actually David uh, McMullen who extended the invitation to me, and I'm, I'm, I know he's not here today, but he did want me specifically to cover what's new in myeloma, and a lot has happened even just in the past year. A lot of what I'll present to you are from tr clinical trials that were presented at the American so Society of Hematology meeting in 2015 in December where a lot of the uh, major pivotal trials that lead to drug approval are presented. Um, so as a forerunner to that, Dave also asked me if I could just run over a little bit uh, about clinical trials, and uh, uh, just so you, everyone's on the same page as I walk you through some of the trials th through the last year. So uh, these are just my uh, disclosures. I do have affiliations with a bunch of uh, pharmaceutical companies because we work on developing many different drugs uh, for patients. So this is what I'm going to be presenting. I'm going to, as I mentioned, start with an overview of trials. And then I'll be running through the um, updates from ASH and I'll be breaking down my talk into the three groups, uh, three groups of patients. One will be those patients who are transplant candidates, their first treatment, and then those patients not eligible for transplant, usually older, maybe not so well, uh, who will, uh, again, first treatment. And then regardless of what you start off with, we know that myeloma is not cured, curable with any of our treatments. So people will need treatment down the road, uh, and so this is a big group, treatment for relapsed and refractory myeloma. So I'm going to go, I'm backing off because I don't know if Tony can see. Can you see? He's sitting on the edge here. Uh, this is a timeline of how we bring a new drug from research to you guys as patients. And um, I'll just run through this. as It's pretty uh, basic broad strokes for research. All starts with an idea. And our basic science research uh, uh, scientists, our, our colleagues, in the lab are the ones who look at what are the targets in cells, what are mechanisms that make cancer cells grow, what are different uh, uh, pathways that are important to interrupt so we can kill that cancer cell. So that's the discovery phase where an idea is identified. And then when we try to take it to develop a drug and, and move it into the clinical realm, that's what we refer to as translational research. We're translating it from basic science to clinical research. And then when we get into clinical research, you're all familiar, or at least have heard about phase one, two, three trials. Not all of you probably are that familiar with what they mean, so I'm gonna run over that very briefly on the next slide. Once you've, uh, a drug has gone through phase three testing, uh, which establishes it as a better treatment than what we already have, our standard, then that usually triggers the drug company or whoever makes that agent to submit a uh, application to get it approved through a regulatory agency. And in Canada, that's Health Canada. In the US, that's the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. And then from there on, the big hurdle beyond that is where we still have to get it funded. And in Canada, funding is very provincial. So we're funded in Canada, sorry, in Ontario by Cancer Care Ontario. So we have to ensure that a drug not only works, um, and, and that's what the approval is all about, but also is cost effective. And so the funding can often uh, d be delayed past approval by a year or more, and this is often where we need patients' help to try to get this, the funding available so we can bring it right into patient care. So this is an outline of what phase one, two, and three means, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but I think it is useful for you to understand because all drugs or treatments have to go through these steps. So you have to start with phase one, where all we're trying to do is establish that a drug or treatment is safe. We're just looking at side effects. We're not looking to see if it works. We just want to make sure that we uh, track the toxicities. Usually a phase one starts with really low doses and then slowly moves up until we hit a point where patients start to get too many side effects and we back off. And when we back off, that's the dose we then take forward to a phase two. 
So the phase one doesn't usually require many patients. We usually only put three or six patients in each group, dose group. But a phase two is where we take the dose that's safe and now we give it to everybody in a phase two. Generally, everyone gets it. It's not usually randomized to anything else, um, although it can be. And then um, the goal with a phase two trial is just to see, does it work now? Uh, does it have any activity? Once we know that a treatment works, that's when we take it into a phase three trial. Phase three trials are often also referred to as randomized control trials <clears throat> because they are random, randomized or arbitrarily you're put into one or the other group and one group is our current standard or some kind of control treatment and the other group is the treatment that we're trying to test. And what the phase three study does is tells us that the treatment is better than what we have. And that's what we need before we start to say, okay, everyone switch over now. And it's usually phase three data that require, is required before a drug is approved or new treatment. You may also sometimes hear about phase four. That's after a drug has been approved and marketed and the company collects more data about safety because sometimes when you look at this, oh sorry, uh, th there aren't a lot of patients that get treated on trials and when you think about the thousands of myeloma patients out there who might be treated, we might miss some rare but significant side effects it, just by testing it in on trials. So phase four is more to determine whether there are additional side effects that we should be aware of. Okay, so that's a run through and I'm going to show you this because uh, I will show you similar kinds of, of slides because this is what we look at a lot when we go to ASH. We see these presentations and they show this study design. This is a study that you're going to hear about later. Um, this was performed by the Dutch and the German myeloma groups and it was taking patients who were untreated, so this is a first line treatment and they were randomizing people into one of two groups. And they are, I only put this slide up to just show you a little bit of the lingo, so when I mention it later, you, um, are, we're again all on the same um, wavelength. So random, randomization means we randomly place patients into one or the other group. Usually it's done by computer. Um, we don't usually toss a coin anymore. Um, the, uh, so you randomized into, and this group was considered the control group. This is an old uh, regimen we used to use. Some of you may remember way back bad. We don't do that anymore. But then you collect stem cells, get transplanted, and thalidomide maintenance. This is the arm that was considered the experimental arm. So this is what we call the control group. This is the experimental group. So there are two arms or two groups to this trial, and it's unblinded. So unblinded means everyone on the study knows which group they're in, okay? If it's blinded, it can either be blinded, the patient is blinded, so the patient doesn't know which group they're in, and it's hard to um, always do that, but uh, you often blind patients by giving them a placebo or something that uh, they can't tell what they're getting. And uh, if you blind, double blind, it means the patient and the treating physician don't know. And what that does, it helps protect us from being biased about the interpretation. So if I look at you and you get a rash, and I know you're on the drug, I might be more inclined to say, oh, that's the drug reaction. Whereas if, uh, uh, if I don't know that you're on a specific drug, then I might say, well, I'm not sure what, what it could be. Maybe it's the antibiotic you're on. So it helps us be a little more impartial. Um, so this is uh, basically what unblinded means. The endpoints are the key thing that I'll refer to a lot uh, as, and we look at a lot of different endpoints. Ultimately, I think most people care whether treatments make you live longer, but it also is important whether the treatment prevents you from progressing earlier. Um, and we use the terms progression-free survival or time to progression a lot. So just so you know, because I'll be mentioning this later, that basically means the length of time from the start of the treatment until your myeloma comes back. So the longer, the better, obviously. So um, those are important parameters uh, to look at. Okay, so enough of 
sort of the outline of the metrics of, of uh, studies. So how do you get on a trial? Well, you ask us. Ask your myeloma team. There are always lots of trials to be available at each phase of your disease. Um, when you get, uh, your, you ask, we often will do an initial screening, just sort of look at what you fit into, we'll look at your blood work, see how you're doing. A lot of it will be, depend on where you live also. I mean, many of you guys I met just earlier live far away. It may not be feasible for you to get in for a trial where you have to be seen every day or every twice a week for a while. Um, the overview of the study, uh, the doctor or the coordinator will go over with you, but you'll also get a consent form that will outline all of it. Very useful to bring a friend or family member to come with you to go over that and take it home and read it. There's no obligation to make any decisions at the time we give it to you. You need to go home and review it first. So questions to ask are, what are the details of the treatment? So it's important to know, is it a pill? Are they injections? How many visits? How long will you be here? If you ask at Princess Margaret, we always say you're going to be here all day for any <laughs> treatment day you come. So the answer is always the same. But the duration of treatment, does it go on forever? Or do you just stay, do the treatment is only eight months, six months? Those are important things to ask. Is there crossover? So sometimes when you're in the control arm, meaning you're getting kind of standard treatment, you want to know if it stops working, can you then cross over and get the new treatment? And that's important for a lot of people. Uh, will you always get the treatment or is it randomized? You sort of, uh, is, it, is it possible you're not going to get the new treatment that's of interest? Will you know what treatment will you get, you're getting or is it blinded? So we've already gone through that. And, and this is key to what extra tests are needed because a lot of you don't want to get extra bone marrow tests or CAT scans or x-rays. Very reasonable to, if, you, if that's a concern for you to decline a trial because you don't uh, want those extra tests. But those extra tests are important for us to get all the information we need to determine whether it's working properly, the treatments. And what are common and serious side effects? In particular, are there any side effects that might build on side effects you already have? Like if you have nerve damage from previous treatment, is this a treatment that's going to make it worse? And then are there extra costs? A lot of trials will reimburse you for things like parking and, uh, and your meals, but sometimes there's not a lot of reimbursement and there's maybe cost involved in traveling down for a trial. So this is just a, a bit of an outline of things to ask. When you, uh, when you are being considered for a trial. Okay, so that was that. I'm now going to move into all the, uh, the new updates. And uh, this is just the outline I mentioned. And I'm going to start with just an outline of, uh, well, an overview of how we manage patients. When we first meet someone who has newly diagnosed myeloma, this is a Princess Margaret approach. We look at whether patients are eligible for transplant or not. And currently, most of that's related to whether you're younger, and in younger myeloma, that's under age 70, um, or if you're fit enough. So we use a lot of parameters to determine fitness, but essentially, you need to be reasonably fit to go to a transplant, because as many of you know, it's hard treatment. So we look at that. If you're older or you're not so well, then you go down the transplant ineligible route, which, um, and I'll talk a little bit about our standards, but our standards currently, we mostly use VMP, which is Valcade, Melphalan, and Prednisone. So um, I'm gonna apologize now because I sometimes use these terms interchangeably, the drug names. I'm gonna try mostly to use the generic names. So Valcade is bortezomib, but bortezomib uh, if I slip in Valcade, that's just uh, accidental. Uh, lenalidomide is Revlimid, and uh, pomalidomide is Pomalist. So e there are a lot of these terms that we use just kind of interchangeably, but you may not recognize them if I'm using them out of place. So if you're transplant eligible, then uh, again, many of you know this, you've gone through this, you get induction therapy. We currently use Cyborg-D, and that's a pretty um, Canadian-wide standard, but if you go to the US, a lot of people get other things. Uh, we get collect stem cells, do the transplant. Uh, many of our patients get outpatient transplants now, and then we generally recommend as a policy at Princess Margaret maintenance with lenalidomide or Revlimid. 
But regardless of which group you go down or which arm you go down, ultimately your disease will grow again and you'll need more treatment. And therefore, uh, we have to have a lot of other treatments available for in the uh, supply of drugs and new treatments for patients with myeloma because they may live many, many more years after this requiring multiple lines of therapy. So this is the outline and that will put into context the groups that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to start with the transplant candidates. These are the younger, remember under age 70 generally, younger and fitter patients. And so there were, every meeting we go to, there are usually some themes that emerge. And so I'm going to try to highlight what was at ASH and the two key questions that were asked and par partly answered uh, were uh, number one, with all our new drugs, do we even need to transplant? So when we started getting Revlimid, lenalidomide, and bortezomib, people were going, gee, these work so well, do we even need to do this transplant anymore? And so I'll address that. And the second question that was addressed in a bunch of different studies was what should we do with high risk patients? And I'll identify what that means in a second. So I'm going to start with the first question. And one of the key studies that was trying to answer the question of whether we need transplant was this trial. It's called the IFM 2009. IFM is the uh, intergroup um, Intergroup France uh, Francophone Myeloma, which is the French myeloma group. And uh, they had a collaboration with Dana Farber, and they were looking at this. This is another one of those study designs where patients started off with RVD this, as induction. RVD is lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone. So this is a fairly common frontline treatment in the US. And then people were randomly put into two groups. One, this is uh, the group that does not get transplanted. These patients get two, uh, uh, two more cycles of RVD, and then uh, they get their stem cells collected in case for later, but they don't get transplanted right away, and then they get another four to eight cycles of RVD with Revlimid maintenance after that. This is the transplant arm. So these patients got the same upfront stuff, RVD, but then they went on to transplant. With another couple of cycles of RVD, we refer that to that often as consolidation when we give it after transplant, and then again, lenalidomide maintenance. So this is a study essentially comparing no transplant to transplant, but with new drugs in there before and after. And what it showed was the, both treatments work really well. Whether you transplant or not, you get really high responses. Virtually everybody responds to these treatments. But if you uh, look at the transplant group, more patients got what we call a VGPR, which is a very good partial response, so deep response. So your protein comes down by 90% or more. And more patients achieved minimal residual disease, which is at an even deeper level of response where we assess it molecularly. You know, you, you look like your myeloma is gone, but we can often measure it still by doing special testing. Uh, minimal residual disease says even with that special testing, we couldn't see it. So very deep response. Does that make a difference in myeloma? Well, we think it does, that the deeper your response goes, the longer it will take before your myeloma grows back later. So, uh, so we often do push people as hard as we can to a limit to get into a deep response. Um, so these were, uh, these were all better with the transplant. And then the time to progression, so again, this is the time from the start of your treatment until the myeloma starts growing back again, was uh, almost a year longer with the transplant thrown in there. So uh, a year is nothing to sniff at. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that uh, you're not going to need more treatment. It just means that there's another year where you're off treatment, hopefully you're feeling well, you're not suffering from complications of treatment or the myeloma. So it's pretty uh, impressive, these data. And it just supports the data we have from a couple of other studies. One of them presented um, actually already published using melphalan, prednisone, and lenalidomide. 
And another one that was presented at ASH also using cyclophosphamide, lenalidomide, and DEX, all comparing to transplant uh, with new drugs stuck in there, and the transplant is, came out ahead. So what that means is, and I'll get to the summary from this part later, is that don't throw out your transplant. The transplant with these new drugs works even better than just the new drugs alone. So um, hence you're going to see us doing a lot of maneuvering with your treatments and you'll see lots of new treatments coming up, new drugs that we're going to start throwing into your induction, your maintenance, maybe even consolidation later. Okay. Um, I'm going to move to the second question, which is what should we do with high-risk patients? What do I mean by high-risk? So there are lots of different features uh, that you can lump into clinical, laboratory, or biologic features or factors that might put you at slightly higher risk uh, in terms of not responding so well or your myeloma coming back earlier. These are things we take into account when we look at you uh, for the first time and decide upon your treatment. Um, many of you are familiar with the, um, the I, I put just the abbreviation here, the International Staging System, we look, which is uh, looking at just two blood tests that help us a little bit determine whether you have more aggressive disease. But the, really the most important um, prognostic factors that help us decide if you're high risk is the uh, fish right now. And this is soon going to change because you're going to see us start to look at mutations and different genetic abnormalities that are tested in a different way. But right now, in 2016, fish is the most important thing. And these are the three fish abnormalities that we and others in Canada generally test regularly that will identify you as not having so good myeloma. And maybe we need to tr step up your treatment a bit. Um, and the most unfortunate group is the 17P deleted patients. Those patients account for maybe at most 10% of patients at diagnosis. And they're the ones who, if we just did a simple single transplant, tend to only get about a year or maybe even less out of a transplant. So you don't get much bang for your buck out of it. So we're always looking for better treatments, particularly for patients with high risk disease. And that's, you've seen this slide before, and that's what this study was uh, trying to address. This is again, as I mentioned, the Dutch uh, myeloma collaborative study, and they compared people, uh, and these were all people, not all myeloma patients, not just the high-risk ones, but there were high-risk patients in there. And they compared them to doing standard treatment or um, a treatment that in, included using bortezomib in the induction and then bortezomib in the maintenance. Okay, we don't use a lot of bortezomib maintenance because it's not approved for that purpose, but some of you who may have high-risk disease may be on it because we can try to get it in specific instances. Um, this was a collaboration between the Dutch and the Germans, and the Germans, all, all the sites did two transplants. And so what that, the reason why I mention that is that this, the group of patients with the the not so good genetic test, 17P deletion, did really well when they got bortezomib, two transplants, and then bortezomib again as maintenance. And uh, these are, uh, sorry, these are curves. And it, it's not important what the numbers are, except just to see that this is a curve in these 17P patients showing that um, it, it's a curve to the time to progression. So, the, the, the deeper the curve, meaning more people are falling off and progressing. So the red curve is not so good, the blue curve is better. And you can see there's clearly a difference. Blue curve was the patients, uh, in this arm, this is the patients just getting standard treatment. But if you actually get um, uh, uh, the bortezomib arm, then your treatment, uh, which was normally the 17Ps in red, can actually get much better, similar to those patients who don't have 17P. So we can almost, with this kind of a treatment, kind of even out the playing field. And so that's very encouraging because uh, uh, if we can get the same results uh, in a 17P patient as we do in others where they get many years potentially out of transplants or two transplants, 
then that's very encouraging. Okay, so these were excellent results. This is actually what we do at Princess Margaret. So if you have high risk disease, we're going to give you bortezomib in Cybor D, two transplants, one after another. We call that tandem transplants. And then we try to put you on bortezomib maintenance. Some of you, there's not a lot of data as to what kind of bortezomib. So some of you might actually be on RVD after transplant. You might be on uh, Velcade and Dex. Combinations can be, are not quite clear which one's the best. But uh, Velcade or bortezomib seems to be an integral part of trying to treat high-risk patients. So, in summary from this first part, the front-line tr front treatment for transplant candidates with all our new drugs, do we need transplant? Yes, we do. Uh, including transplant with new drugs seems to add value. And, but the best new drugs, we're not quite sure. I showed you there's RVD, there's CRD, there's MPR. We're not quite sure, so you're going to keep seeing all these new combinations coming out. What should we do with high-risk patients? I already went over that bortezomib before and after, tandem transplants, looks encouraging, and this is our current policy. Okay, so I've finished that part. Now I'm going to move on to frontline treatment for patients who aren't well enough to be transplanted or they're over age 70. And I only say 70 because that's our cutoff, but some centers use 65 or they, some centers don't have any cutoff. So this is very skewed towards what we do at Princess Margaret. So what do we normally give patients who are older and not fit enough for transplant? These are three different regimens that have been shown to be effective. And uh, the, uh, currently, uh, we mostly use VMP. VMP is bortezomib or Velcade, melphalan and prednisone. The first two regimens have been around for a few years, and they were all meant to build on adding a new drug to melphalan and prednisone. Some of you might know that we've been using melphalan and prednisone for decades. Uh, it's an old combination but it didn't work that well. But it's pretty easy to take. They're pills. Uh, when we started getting these new treatments, we added on new treatments. So this one was malpalan prednisone plus thalidomide. That was one of our first new drugs. And then this one's malpalan prednisone plus bortezomib or Velcade. And that one also showed, both of these showed that adding on something new was much better than just malpalan and prednisone alone. We don't use MPT a lot because the thalidomide has lots of side effects. I don't know if anyone, I know there's someone in the audience who is on it because I just met him earlier, but um, so thalidomide's not easy to take in a long, in necessarily because it has lots of side effects, but um, so we tend to defer a lot to VMP. In 2014, RD, which is lenalidomide index, uh, was compared to MPT and found to be much better. So uh, it's not officially funded yet though and for frontline treatment. So even though we would, and probably many patients would prefer Revdex over VMP, v Velcade is uh, an injection, it's a bit of a pain in the neck to give, and RD is just all pills. Uh, we don't have routine access to this yet. But I only put this up because these are the treatments that we consider standard right now. And in general, most people, well, three quarters of patients respond, uh, and it, they, the effect lasts maybe two years before you, it starts to grow again, need more treatment. So the key question about this group of patients at ASH was, can we do better than that? Uh, are there better regimens that work better or are less toxic or are more convenient? Uh, and then we always have to look at cost. So one of the key studies and again, this is another study outline uh, that was presented at ASH to try to address this question was this SWOG trial. SWOG means uh, Southwestern Oncology Group, and we collaborate often with SWOG and ECOG, which is Eastern uh, uh, Oncology Group. So there's all sorts of different uh, collaborative cancer treating groups in the U.S. And it was a phase three, so phase three randomized trial, uh, and patients were, who were not planned for transplant either got Rev-Dex, uh, which is 
one of our standards, not yet, a, not, not yet funded, but one of the good frontline treatments. Or they got rev, Revlimid or lenalidomide plus bortezomib and dex, RVD. Again, you're going to hear lots of RVD. It, the, the thing about RVD is it combines two of our main drugs. You've got a proteasome inhibitor, um, bortezomib, and we've got an immunomodulatory drug, lenalidomide. You put them together, they work so much better. Throw in a bit of dex, even better. So that's why you hear a lot about these kinds of combos. Um, and then people just continued long-term on RevDax. And what it showed was the combination, three-drug combination, had led to higher responses. And the PFS, which is the progression-free survival, we talked about before, which is sort of the time it takes until your disease starts to grow again, uh, was, was much better. Again, about a year longer than if you just did uh, RevDex alone. So this is the kind of numbers we're getting in the younger patients who are actually getting transplanted. So we're now even in older patients without a transplant able to achieve pretty good outcomes. And so RVD is much better. So um, are there, that, that was one of the key trials showing that in this older population who can't get transplanted, maybe we need to step it up a bit. Let's uh, move on beyond the double treatments and add a third drug, uh, RVD being one of them. But some of the newer proteasome inhibitors, so the only one we have uh, that we've been using routinely is bortezomib, were uh, highlighted also at ASH. So there's lots of new things. Proteasome inhibitors, just so you know, this is, um, what a proteasome is, it's inside this cancer cell, and it's kind of like a barrel. So there are, uh, there are different proteins that go in, and then this is like a, a garburator, and it uh, just spews out, uh, the, uh, it breaks down the different cells, or it breaks down the different uh, proteins that may be important in keeping cancer growth going. And so the inside, if you look at sort of a cross section of this, and you think of this more as a barrel, if you look at it from the front top down, it looks like this, uh, with different air areas, enzymes in here that help to break down the proteins. And what we want to do is inhibit the proteasome, because then that allows proteins that normally regulate cancer cell growth to work. They're not being uh, broken down. So I'm only putting this here because bortezomib, which is our standard proteasome inhibitor, inhibits these three enzyme parts within the barrel. And exazomib is a newer uh, proteasome inhibitor, and that was talked about a lot at ASH, and in fact was FDA approved in myeloma right before ASH in November 2015. So it's one of the drugs that's coming. And it an, uh, it's, works very similarly to bortezomib by blocking the three different uh, enzyme areas. But exazomib's a pill, a capsule, a whole lot easier than getting injections. So there's the big advantage with exazomib. If you uh, look at um, the, uh, yet another uh, proteasome inhibitor that you'll hear lots about, carfilzomib. So carfilzomib is uh, doesn't attack all these enzymes, it just attacks the, what we think is the most important enzyme for inhibiting cancer growth. And as a result, uh, a lot of the times uh, drugs hit a whole bunch of targets, and some of the targets they hit cause side effects that are not needed for the active activity of the drug. Um, and in, when it comes to blocking off these enzymes, it probably helps that it doesn't, uh, it's not so, um, it's a bit more targeted, so it doesn't have a lot of these other uh, toxicities uh, like the neuropathy associated with uh, Velcade or bortezomib. And because it's irreversible, so it binds and it doesn't fall off, and Velcade falls off eventually, it probably is a more potent proteasome inhibitor. So carfilzomib was talked about a lot, and you'll hear more why we, it was just approved in January in Canada. So Health Canada approved car, carfilzomib. So lots of new drugs. This, is also, this drug is also known as Kiprolis. So, um, so I talked about RVD combination, 
but you're going to see lots of other combinations for patients who aren't going to transplant uh, using all these new proteasome inhibitors, carfilzomib, exazomib, and um, carfilzomib normally is kind of hard to give because it's, it's given twice a week, two days in a row, for three weeks in a row, so that's six visits in three weeks. So that's a lot of visits. You have to really live like next door to the hospital. Um, these are testing this in a weekly uh, administration, so similar now to how we give bortezomib. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll see something a little bit easier to administer. And then I already talked about exazomib, it's a pill or capsule, so a whole lot easier than injections. So you're going to hear lots more about these combinations for older patients who can't um, get transplanted. So I'm going to have these little bubbles pop up now and then because these are bubbles referring to the trials that we have at Princess Margaret. So we're not involved with any of the trials on this page, but we are testing exazomib right now in patients who aren't going to transplant uh, and uh, testing it as a maintenance therapy afterwards. So if you are interested and you're, not, you're, not, you're getting some treatment that isn't leading to transplant uh, and it's going to stop at some point, usually it's a year of treatment, then, uh, and you're interested, this is available as a maintenance therapy. Okay, so for this group of patients, I've already talked about our standards, MPT, but mostly we're using VMP right now, current standards, but you're going to see a lot of new treatments, uh, combinations, RVD and other proteasome inhibitors. Uh, more promise, well, they look very promising, but they're expensive and they're pretty intensive. So that's always a problem for us in Canada in terms of accessing drugs that are expensive. Okay, so I'm going to move into the relapse refractory myeloma uh, section. So regardless of what your first treatment is, you will need a second treatment. Everyone will relapse, so we prepare for that. And when you relapse, sometimes it's just your proteins climbing. You don't quite need treatment yet, so we often have time to talk to you about your options. You can think about it while we watch the proteins. This is not always an optimal time to start treatment. We don't wait until you're sick, but we also don't start you necessarily right the minute that you, we see your protein climbing. So don't, don't feel like you have to be rushed into making decisions. But these are all the factors that we have to take into account and discuss with you guys when we're deciding about what treatment to use next. So what are the features of the drug, drug itself? Is it oral or an injection? So a lot of that relays down to down here. Where do you live? If you live five hours from the hospital, it would be very hard for you to come in once a week or twice a week to get some inject injectable treatments. Um, the uh, toxicities, so we mentioned this before, if a drug is known to cause some problems with the nerves and you already are struggling with neuropathy, that may not be the right treatment for you. Um, how are these drugs cleared from the body? And the most important one is, does it rely on the kidneys to clear? Half of myeloma patients have kidney dysfunction at some time during their course of disease. So if it's a drug that, like Revlimid or lenalidomide, where 80% of the drug is cleared by the kidneys, it might make it a little tougher to use these treatments if your kidneys aren't working well. Uh, and then funding. So you might hear about a great combination of treatments, but we might not always be able to get every component for you. In, in Ontario particularly, you know that we're often restricted to just using these new drugs once. And later, when we want to use it again in a different combination, it's not so easy to get. So that's why you'll hear us often asking you, do you have drug insurance? Is there some other way we can get it for you? Okay, um, patient characteristics. So we already talked about your other health issues, where you live, uh, how mobile you are. If you find it really hard to travel, then it's going to be hard to do a treatment where you have to come to the hospital twice a week. Uh, your age, and of course your patient preference. And then we also look at your disease characteristics. How did you respond to your treatments before? Which drugs seem to work well? Do you have high risk disease? And do you have any complications that we need to take into account? Particularly low blood counts. If your white count or your neutrophils are already low, some of the treatments we use, which are very hard on the blood counts, may be very hard to give you. 
So we may avoid that because, for drugs that are not so hard on the blood counts. Okay. So these are all the things that we take into account. When a patient of mine comes and they are relapsing, I give them three op big options of treatments. If they've had a transplant before, we'll talk potentially about doing another transplant and we call that a salvage transplant. So when you do two transplants one after another, that's a tandem. When we do a salvage, it's when you had one a long time ago and you do another one later. Uh, you, there's always clinical trials and then there are combinations using these drugs as our backbones. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about these, um, but I'm going to just have one slide to talk about salvage transplants. Not every center does a second transplant. We routinely collect stem cells the first time around if you're young enough uh, and save them for down the road if you need it for a second transplant. Not every center does that. Uh, we base this largely on our own data that is shown here that if we uh, do a second transplant, basically everyone uh, responds the second time, so as people can still do well with another transplant. But patients do much better if they got a long, you know, kick in the can from the first transplant. So improved outcomes if it's been at least two years from your first. So that's currently our policy that it, you have to have had a relatively good length of time from your first before we offer you a second. If you only get six months out of your first transplant, and that unfortunately happens in some patients, then there's no value to doing another one because you'll probably get less than that. And it's a lot of effort and uh, you know, hardship for you guys to do one and to get two months out of it. So these, this, this is what establishes our policy that uh, we'll offer a salvage transplant only if you're still under age 70, if you've got stem cells frozen, and if you uh, got at least two years out of your first. So that's the salvage transplant out of the way. Most of the time, so if you do your salvage transplant and then you relapse again, uh, you're still going to come down to this point where everyone else is, where we're going to look at combined treatments with all of our backbone drugs. And originally, these backbone drugs, so again, this is Valcade, this is Revlimid, this is Pomalist, this pomalidomide was approved in 2014. And um, they were all originally approved in combination just with dexamethasone. So we call these doublets, like double drugs, two together. What you're gonna see emerging is that we're moving towards triplets and maybe even quadruplets. And you might go, oh my gosh, I have to have four drugs at once. Well, part of the reason is, and I won't dwell on it much, is that we know that multiple myeloma is named appropriately because it's multiple clones right from the very beginning. You might have 100 clones and one of those clones is really sensitive to Revlimid, one of them is more sensitive to Velcade. And so when you treat, treat patients one after another, uh, you might kill a couple of these clones that are sensitive, but then these ones will grow through. So that's why we are moving towards using a whole bunch of drugs to try to hit a whole bunch of clones at once. Okay? So um, there is a rationale. We're not just trying to make you guys suffer with all the combinations. Um, so bortezomib and lenalidomide are generally treatments we use for people who are less heavily pretreated. So usually we mean like they've had one or three prior lines of treatment. A transplant includes one whole line. Um, whereas pomalidomide is approved more for patients who have already had these two and failed them. And so they're more for heavily pretreated. We refer to them either as double exposed, meaning they've had these two, but they could have responded nicely to them and just stopped them and now relapsing, or they're double refractory meaning they've been on them and they stopped working. Okay, so obviously the double refractory patients are their tougher patients because they actually failed the treatment, not just stopped it and then relapsed later. Okay, so the key questions asked, or the key question asked at ASH uh, for uh, relapsed myeloma is obviously do we have better therapies than what we can use? Anything better than these double treatments, these doublets? And so um, I'm going to revolve uh, the talk about grouping patients into sort of lighter treated than those who have had more than two treatments 
And then I know you're going to want to hear about some of the new treatments, particularly the immunotherapies that are coming up. So there are three trials that are useful to be aware of, uh, building on RevDex. Uh, so remember I said these are now our backbone treatments, RevDex, Velcadex. And now we're looking at getting a new drug, adding it on. So you've got three drugs. Okay, so these are triplets based on RevDex. They're all, these are three different trials that have been presented. They're randomized trials comparing the three drug combination to RevDex alone. RevDex is a common regimen we use right now in myeloma relapse. So we are trying to make them better. Um, and uh, these are for patients who have had only one to three prior lines of treatment. So carfilzomib RevDex, I'm going to go over this try in a little bit of detail because this is the trial that led to Health Canada approval for carfilzomib in January this year. Okay, so we currently do have access to carfilzomib in this combination uh, through an extended access program because the funding isn't quite there. Remember I said there's often a delay in funding. We don't have Cancer Care Ontario funding yet for this combination, but it is very close. And then these two are hot on their heels. Uh, and I'll talk about what these are, uh, but they're, they're pending, not yet Health Canada approved. This is the ASPIRE trial that compared uh, carfilzomib RevDex to RevDex. They, they put a K for carfilzomib because often if you put C in there, people think, think it's cyclophosphamide, which many of you have had. So that's why um, it's KRD versus RevDex. This was a trial that was um, presented at our major meeting by Keith Stewart, many of you who probably remember used to work here at Princess Margaret. Um, he's now at the Mayo Clinic. So um, these patients had, remember they're relapsed, had one to three prior lines of treatment, and then they were uh, randomly put into one of two groups, either our standard RevDex or RevDex plus carfilzomib. Now, this is kind of detailed here, but it's just going to show you that carfilzomib is not an easy drug to give in terms of scheduling. So it's given days 1, 2, 8, 9, 15, 16. That means it's two days in a row at the beginning of each week. So if you might do it, you're here every Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, and then you get a week off. So it's not easy to come for this. And this, but at least after cycle 12, so after a year of doing that, uh, you go down to just doing, uh, you know, day one, two, so Monday, Tuesday, then you're off a week, and then Monday, Tuesday, then you're off a week. So it uh, starts alternating. And then after a year and a half, the carfilzomib part stops, and then you just keep going with the pills. So it's just hard to do for the first year primarily, but it does mean that you have to be very tied to the hospital. Whereas RevDex is just pills alone. So there is a definite uh, improvement in, in convenience with RevDex. So this study, the primary endpoint for most of these trials is progression-free survival. So in a way, it, it, it's not exactly the same as the time to progression, but it basically gives you an idea of how long that response works. And these are curves that show, and again, you don't need to really know what the numbers are per se, but the, the top curve, if it's always a top curve and you can see that they separate, the top curve is always better. And the top curve here is the combination of carfilzomib plus RevDex. And what that means is, is the progression-free survival was 26 months, so two years. That's darn good when you think that a lot of our first-line treatments give you two years. So this is after someone's already had two or three treatments, and then you can get a treatment that still gives you two years. That's pretty impressive data. This is the longest progression-free survival data we have for any combination in a randomized trial, and definitely better than RevDex alone. Okay, so um, encouraging, but carfilzomib not only is um, a little onerous in terms of how frequently it's given, but it has side effects. So as with a lot of these drugs, they cause low blood counts. The RevDex alone caused low blood counts. Then you add on carfilzomib, and about a third of the patients get, um, uh, get low neutrophil counts, which puts you at risk for infections. So we have to watch for that. 
And some of the earlier trials with carfilzomib showed uh, some concern with heart issues, uh, high blood pressure, maybe some fluid overload, so maybe problematic in those patients who already have some heart problems. So um, those studies, however, were usually using higher doses than what's used in this combination. So it was at least reassuring from this trial that we didn't see a lot of that with this combination. Um, and we didn't see very much of the neuropathy, which is something we see with Belcade a lot, bortezomib. So we think the bortezomib, um, that often the effect of the nerves is from the way it works as a proteasome inhibitor. This is also a proteasome inhibitor, but it doesn't seem to lead to as much neuropathy, which is really nice. So in summary from this trial, um, the carfilzomib added to RevDex is very active, so I already mentioned how impressive this PFS is, and it was approved just in January. <clears throat> but the toxicities do require caution, and it's kind of inconvenient uh, in terms of scheduling. So currently at Princess Margaret, we have a phase three trial where we're comparing once weekly to the twice weekly carfilzomib. And maybe, like Valcade, some of you may remember when we first started using bortezomib, we were giving it on Mondays and Thursdays or Tuesdays and Fridays twice a week, uh, and it was a pain in the neck. And then there were studies uh, that showed that once a week dosing at a slightly higher dose was just as good. So I think that's the direction carfilzomib's gonna go. It'll be a lot easier to give once a week. So the other two combinations that are hot on the heels of KRD involve new drugs uh, like alotuzumab. So, so we're now starting to see a whole new group of drugs. This is, these are the monoclonal antibodies. And what antibodies do is they can target, they identify a target on a cancer cell, and that target can be specific to a myeloma cancer cell and land on that cancer cell. And uh, like alotuzumab kills the cancer cell in two different ways. It can actually directly um, activate a, an immune cell to actually, this is a natural killer cell. These are immune cells you normally have. And these immune cells then attack the cancer cell. Or they can actually um, uh, directly bind to the cancer cell itself and activate uh, a cancer cell killing uh, directly. So they're, they're very encouraging, and we call this, because you're taking advantage of your own immune system, this is part of immunotherapy, okay? Um, so the combination of uh, elotuzumab plus RevDex was actually already published um, in uh, the New England Journal last year, but at ASH there was a longer follow-up presentation and uh, essentially is also encouraging, but the PFS looks a bit shorter than what we saw with KRD. Remember, it was 26 months. This one's 19 months, so maybe not as good, but this is a really easy drug to administer. Uh, it's still IV, given once a week, but, um, and the main reactions are infusion reactions. So when you have anything in uh, monoclonal antibody, they tend to cause sometimes fevers or blood pressure changes or uh, stomach problems uh, as in nausea and vomiting when they're running in. So infusion problems uh, are something to watch for, but they're not usually insurmountable. Some of you uh, who may know lymphoma, we use rituximab all the time. It's a monoclonal antibody and we, uh, the infusion reactions are manageable. So that's one promising combo that's already out there. So they're looking to approve this combination. And then the other combo is exazomib plus RevDex. So exazomib, remember, is the oral protosome inhibitor, sort of the oral equivalent of bortezomib. And uh, so in, uh, this was presented at ASH also, uh, combining the three versus just RevDex. And it showed that the combination was much better than RevDex. With the PFS, so the, again, the duration it keeps things quiet, about 20 months. So about the same as elotuzumab, RevDex, maybe not as good as KRD, carfilzomib, RevDex. But the big advantage with uh, this regimen is it's all oral. Uh, so there's no visits necessarily to the hospital for injections. 
So take home messages for this group of patients for relapse is doublets or double treatments are probably on their way out. We're heading into triplets. And which triplet is best? So far, KRD looks like it's the most effective, but it uh, has side effects and is not easy to give. So we have to temper our uh, thoughts there. And these are expensive regimens. So it, that's always a limiting factor for us. They make work well, but getting funding takes into account what other treatments we have available, and there may be limitations in uh, how these are funded. So I'm now going to move into the patients who have already had uh, bortezomib and lenalidomide, so they're the more heavily pretreated patients. And uh, th these drugs that I'll talk about are pomalidomide, daratumumab, and then some new stuff that's a little further down the road. Pomalidomide, and some of you may be on POM, was approved in 2014. And as I said before, it's really for patients who have already had bortezomib and lenalidomide. Uh, and they um, w progressed on their last one. So they have to have kind of failed those two. And so it's our current go-to drug uh, or combination with DEX in patients who have already uh, had Velcade and uh, Revlimid. And there are lots and lots of combinations under investigation with POM-DEX. These were all combinations that were presented at ASH. I'm not going to go into detail with them because they're all still relatively early in uh, in uh, testing, carfilzomib, bortezomib, exazomib, all protosome inhibitors to combine with POM, which is an immunomodulatory drug. As you know, pomalidomide, lenalidomide, thalidomide, they're all in the same group of drugs. Um, and then uh, apromazib, which is an oral version of carfilzomib. So exazomib is an oral version of bortezomib. I didn't make up these names, by the way. <laughs> so, but there, these are all in the works. Okay. Um, so, POMDEX is our new backbone of combinations for more heavily pretreated patients. So, they're adding on. So, we're getting into triple and even quadruple treatments for these groups of patients. So, we currently have a study open looking at the combination of pomalidomide, dexamethasone, and carfilzomib. Uh, at Princess Margaret. This is a phase one, two, so we're partly looking at the right dose and then just to see how well it works. It's not yet in phase three testing. Daratumumab is another drug you're going to hear a lot about if you haven't already. It's a, another monoclonal antibody. Uh, I didn't talk much about the target with elotuzumab, the other antibody, but it basically uh, daratumumab has a different target. It targets something called CD38, which is a marker on myeloma cells, plasma cells. And it works, uh, it's represented by the little green bits here, where it binds to the target on the cancer cell, and it works by doing a whole bunch of things, including uh, getting immune cells to, uh, it tags the cancer cells so immune cells know to kill it. It can directly uh, activate substances in the blood that blast holes in the membrane. It can do a lot of different things, uh, and it's very targeted, so it's not going to go bind to your red cells, because red cells don't have this target. Okay. Um, and so daratumumab is being touted as a drug for those who are more heavily pretreated, uh, including those who are double refractory, so those who have blown right through uh, Revlimid and uh, Velcade. And, um, and uh, using just daratumumab alone, so remember, we're moving way past single drugs, but in this setting, with just one drug, um, and you may not think this is that remarkable, but with one drug alone, in patients who have had four or five other treatments already, failed Revlimid and Velcade, a third of them responded. That's pretty good, and we know we can do better by doing combinations. So, this drug, based on this, this study, um, was approved by the FDA in November 2015 and is currently available in Canada on extended access program. So ask your doctor what that means. And, um, but it's, it's moving along towards uh, Health Canada approval as well. So this is a drug that's very encouraging but it's a monoclonal antibody, needs to be given IV, infusion, has side effects, 
Um, I'm going to, I just put up some of these, uh, either a quarter to a third of patients have any of these side effects. But the ones we mostly worry about with monoclonal antibodies are the side effects when the drug is running in. So again, as I mentioned before, fevers, chills, you know, blood pressure changes, you know, stomach uh, upset, those can happen while they're running in. So daratumabav is very active, but you have to be cautious with the infusion reactions. And uh, often the first infusion takes many hours. So this is something that's a little bit onerous for institutions and patients. But it's, it's coming. We currently have a phase two study in patients with smoldering myeloma. So these are patients who have myeloma, but they don't have any bone problems, their blood counts are good, their kidneys are great. So they're not yet needing active treatment. So these patients are being tested to see if we give an intermittent dose of daratumumab, whether that'll keep your disease quiet longer before you need treatment. Okay, uh, and then this last section of my talk is all about new treatments uh, that you're going to hear a lot about. These are very exciting. There is lots about immunotherapy. I've already talked about what immunotherapy means. It sort of means trying to take advantage of your own immune system to kill cancer cells but there are many different ways you can do it. Um, so I'm going to talk about checkpoint inhibitors and then CAR T cell treatment and then another uh, drug that's not really immunotherapy but we're involved with, with Myeloma Canada that's very uh, uh, promising. So you may have heard about checkpoint inhibitors. These are uh, drugs that inhibit an inhibitor. So normally in your body you have inhibitors to your normal immune system uh, in, including T cells. T cells are cancer cells, not sorry, are normal immune cells that kind of look out and see what's not supposed to be there. They see foreign bodies, they see, they may see bacteria, you know, and try to attack the foreign substances. A cancer cell is supposed to be perceived as, as foreign and so your immune system should try to get rid of it, but often the immune system's not very active or else the cancer cell doesn't present itself as being very foreign. So we have to try to improve on that uh, recognition as well as the activity of our immune system. So normally in our immune system we have inhibitors of our immune cells. And so what this drug does is it inhibits that inhibitor so that we no longer have your immune system dampened and it's more active. And um, so it really relies on your own immune system to get rid of the cancer. The problem with that is that, that often we activate the immune system then and people can get side effects like rash, colitis, hepatitis, pneumonitis. These are, uh, colitis is the inflammation of the bowel, inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the lungs, all due to activating your immune system. So um, the drug that I'm referring to is pembrolizumab, but there are many other checkpoint inhibitors out there. And they're basically, uh, again, a monoclonal antibody to this inhibitor uh, that inhibits T cells. So we currently have a phase three trial. So we're getting quite far along with this drug um, that is combining uh, pembrolizumab with Revdex versus Revdex. So it's another one of those uh, combinations using a backbone here, m much like KRD, ERD, IRD that I talked about earlier. You've probably heard about CAR T cells. These come up all the time. Um, the uh, CARs are referred to as chimeric uh, antigen receptors. They're, they're proteins that recognize cancer markers. And uh, the CAR, what happens, what, what, it, what is done here is that the CAR gene, which is here, it's inserted into a virus, which is a, we call it a viral vector. So it's a vector is like a carrier, and that can carry it into the uh, T cell. T cells, remember, immune cells that help uh, contribute to fighting off your cancer. So we actually bring the gene for the CAR into the DNA of the T cell, and then that allows the T cell to express the CAR, uh, CAR antigen, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is a receptor that can recognize cancer markers. So now your T cell 
can recognize the cancer better. It wasn't very good at recognizing it before. So now it, it, here's your T cell with the car on it and it can bind to, and this car T cell was um, manipulated to bind to CD19. This is a marker that you can see on cancer cells. And uh, the T cell now can recognize that cancer cell and it's activated because on this end of the car, it's, it's, uh, it activated the uh, act activity of this cell. It can now kill this cell. So this is very interesting treatment um, that uh, is, has been able to lead to really dramatic responses in patients, but it's no small treatment because um, you not only, this is how it works, you actually uh, have to take the patient's cells, um, and you, so you take the cells and you have to manipulate them with all this, the genes going in by virus, so this requires a whole uh, basically a whole lab to do this that has the expertise and then once that gene has been inserted into the T cell uh, T cells and the DNA then those T cells are expanded because you don't you need more T cells and then you give the patient chemo and you infuse those T cells that can uh, act on the residual cancer so this is a whole it's almost like a transplant um, but um, you need to have this tech technology to do the, the uh, gene transfer. And that technology is not quite here in Canada. There is a company that's trying, uh, that has patented that process. And uh, we're working with, and are working with different transplant centers, including our own, to do the kind of treatment where we pull patient samples and then we send them out to be uh, manipulated elsewhere and then they send them back to us and then we do this treatment. But it's not something that's, it's, that's around the corner. Okay, I think some of you have saw a TV show recently and I, in the last clinic I had, I had five people ask me about the measles virus and all, sort of similar idea there. It's not around the corner. This is still down the road, but very encouraging immunotherapy. And the, this was presented at ASH this last year, where um, this, they used a specific target uh, that is seen in most myeloma patients. And in 12, this is very small numbers, 12 heavily pretreated patients, they had two go into very deep molecular remissions. So that's impressive given that these patients probably have five or six prior treatments already. You know that the more treatment you get, the harder it is to get into a very, very deep response. So this is very encouraging, but quite early still. And then the last drug I'm going to mention is one that we are testing through Myeloma Canada, the uh, Myeloma Canada Research Network, MCRN. It's uh, the 002 trial. And what this drug does is takes advantage of this XPO1. XPO1 is a protein that, this is the cancer cell here, and this is the membrane and this is outside the cell. So the XPO1 is a, it's a protein that shuttles other proteins out of the nucleus into the outside the cell. So then when they're outside, they get broken up and they don't work anymore. So this is uh, the normal pattern here. What this uh, uh, drug called Selenexor does is it inhibits this protein so that these other things that normally get shuttled out and get broken down are stuck inside the nucleus. And the key things that are stuck inside are what we call tumor suppressor proteins, which work to suppress your tumors from growing. So if you can keep them in the nucleus, the inside of the cell, uh, where they are working actively, then this, can't, this cell can't grow and proliferate. So it's a very interesting mechanism for a new drug and this is just to show you in our first trial where we were using this drug just by itself. This is a patient of one of my colleagues who was on, got a transplant, was on Revlimid maintenance, had Revdex at relapse, then got pomalidomide, Velcadex, and kept getting worse and worse. This is the light chain that was going up into the you know, very high ranges. We got one dose of Selenexor and we saw a dramatic improvement in the numbers. We see this sometimes also with other drugs, but this one is very encouraging with just very early responses. 
It does have side effects, obviously, so we're working through that right now, but there's a, there is a trial, um, as I mentioned, through the Myeloma Canada Research Network. Um, we're one of the key sites where we're testing this drug Selenexor in all these backbone combinations. Okay, so three different arms in that trial. So what's new in myeloma in general? Uh, Frontline, we've already gone through this, don't throw out transplant. Uh, older patients, the uh, combinations, uh, newer combinations are going to displace VMP and Revdex. In the relapse refractory setting, it was, as I've mentioned throughout, we've had a flurry of FDA approvals. Uh, daratumumab, elituzumab, exazimib, all approved just in November of 2015. So it's been a very active year of treatment of new, um, uh, new drugs for myeloma. In the less heavily treated group, triplets are moving towards the new standard. In the more heavily treated, we're looking at fine-tuning the use of pomalidomide with combinations uh, and then uh, introduction of daratumumab. Uh, and very exciting immunotherapy approaches with these checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T cells and other new drugs with uh, new mechanisms, Salonexor. Uh, but the progress in myeloma therapy is all due to research, so we really want to thank all of you for your participation. Obviously, we can't do any of this without patients. So I'd like to just close there, and thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so there's a question about stem cell storage. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, stem cells, we, when we freeze stem cells, they, they can live, they can stay viable or you know, usable for many, many years. We don't, at Princess Margaret, throw them out after a time frame. Um, but because you know, in the past, patients didn't live over 10, 15, you know, 20 years, we were often looking at pa how they were, patients were doing if they had stem cells left over. And we would just throw them out because we didn't think people would be using them. We obviously would notify patients. But there's no expiry, but there's no expiry date per se. But so. Um, so the question is, if you give, do a transplant, you get stem cells and they don't take, and we ref what do you do? And that's what we refer to as no lack of engraftment, right, non-engraftment. That's not common. So out of the 300 and some transplants we did last year, there were like three patients that had slow counts to recover. Not zero recovery, but just slow. Very occasionally, if they have stem cells left over, we may use them to boost that, the counts again. But most of the time, we don't have that trouble with autologous transplants. Autologous meaning your own stem cells. There's more of a problem with allogeneic transplants, where the stem cells don't take and there's more non-engraftment. So we usually don't have that trouble. What we prioritize is if the, we use the stem cells that are frozen for your next transplant, we use them as your first relapse treatment. So if you have a transplant and then you relapse three years later, we're not gonna do Revdex, then Velcade treatment, and then pomalidomide and all that, and then say, you know, let's try transplant late, because the older you get, you know, the possibility you'll get other health problems. So we don't, we use the stem cells at the first time that you relapse. And if you aren't, decide not to use them at that time, then we usually discard them because we can't keep stem cells just forever for no reason. So that is the only caveat there, but officially there's no time frame for throwing them out. Like they're still good 10 years later. Is there a rule of uh, so the question was if you're, uh, if you got 12 years out of your first transplant and you get transplanted again, will you, how much time will you get out of the next one? It's hard to say. Um, I think a lot of us just ballpark and tell patients, well, we hope you get another, you know, half of that same first time, maybe six years. But you know, a lot will depend on what we do with a second transplant. Sometimes with a second, we'll put you on maintenance because people were not on maintenance the first time. So maybe you'll get longer than half. Maybe you'll get the same. So uh, on the other hand, the more treatments you get, often the more 
uh, difficult your disease is to treat. So often people with the subsequent treatments don't get as much time with the exact same therapy. Uh, it's really a question about could you expand on CAR T cell therapy in myeloma. And, uh, and it's true the reason why I think it's getting so much attention is because we are getting such deep, deep responses to the point where we think, are we curing people? And because we're mostly treating patients who have had lots and lots of treatment already, we think, well, maybe if we start moving it earlier, that we can get into, you know, be, people are potentially curable. Uh, because again, we're, we're not just trying to blast away the cancer cells, we're actually trying to just get your immune system to keep it under check. Um, and so I think because of the deep, deep responses we can see, we're encouraged also the same as you're, you're thinking that maybe there's a cure down the road, maybe this has to be combined with other stuff, maybe we have to, you know, we, we don't know yet because the problem with this is it's no small treatment. It's not like you just market a drug and you just ship it in a little pill bottle and you take a pill every day. It requires a lot of of manpower and lab resources and it requires a transplant center to perform it. So it's almost like way back in the, you know, early 1980s when we did transplants for the first time. It took a long time for us to get that set up. So it's encouraging, but, and back then when we got it set up, we thought maybe this is a cure and we were wrong. It's not a cure, but we get closer and closer to making myeloma more of a chronic disease, it's still far from being cured, but there's potential. Yeah. Right, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah, how many people have lived a long time? Because I was saying, and that's the question, uh, we thought we might just pull the room, if people don't mind, because I just, in my clinic last Thursday, I said I saw like six people who are well over 10 years, and we never used to see that. So maybe we could get a show of hands for people who are over 10 years from diagnosis. Excellent. Over five years, even five years we never used to quote. See, excellent. So you know, these are numbers that we never used to see at all. Way back when I first started treating myeloma, like 15 years ago, we were still quoting two to three years for patients. And we were still using a lot of melphalan and prednisone. We didn't have all these drugs. It was years of, of uh, me being in practice before we even got thalidomide, which was the first new drug. And we were like amazed by that. So, so much has happened. I think it, we really do need to, to be happy that you have so many choices. So the question is, uh, do we have any anything new about the root cause of myeloma or what, uh, you know, is the incidence increasing and why? Um, the incidence isn't really increasing. Um, it's relatively stable, although I think we're better at picking it up because we have better testing and people are more aware of it. Um, and we're picking patients up earlier before they actually get active disease. Uh, so they're more like smoldering. And as you saw, I mentioned we have a smoldering trial. So we're starting to get to patients earlier and earlier to prevent people from getting to the active stage. Um, we have learned a lot about uh, the molecular uh, underpinnings of myeloma in terms of what are the genetic, uh, not just like fish genetic abnormalities, but what, what, at a gene level, what are some mutations that are important in, um, in myeloma cancer cell development as well as growth and proliferation. And uh, so we've learned a lot, uh, and you, I know Dr. Tiedemann came to speak to you recently and he talked all about you know, the, the actual precursor cells that uh, we're not just treating, we shouldn't just be treating the myeloma cells because there are early cancer you know, uh, precursor cells that we should be uh, attacking as well. So we have learned a lot about the mutations. What we're not quite, uh, we're not quite, we're at the point where all the mutations we find we can, we have a treatment for. So if I did your, uh, I was telling someone else earlier that we have a, a study right now where if we do a bone marrow, we, we're sending off the bone marrow samples to 
an outside center, and as part of a study, they're looking at 500 different types of mutations. Well, that's all good and, and nice to see. We can see the mutations are involved in different types of pathways. Like this one's involved with how the skeleton of the cell is, is structured and things. This one's against the, uh, how the, I don't know, the metabolism of the cell. Those are just examples. But we're not quite at the point where if we find a mutation or we find 500 mutations that we have treatments that can target them. So right now we're more at the point where it's discovery. We're still kind of looking. What mutations do people have? Um, some of you mentioned in the break that you are on some trials and some of those have targeted treatments in there already. Um, but, but the long and the short of it is um, there isn't any earth shattering data about, um, you know, if you're exposed to this food or something that that's responsible for developing myeloma. So unfortunately, no. And when do you do fish studies? We do fish usually at the diagnostic bone marrow because it does help us decide on your initial treatment. Uh, so we encourage people when they're uh, getting uh, their first, you know, when physicians are doing a bone marrow and they think it's likely that, it's, that the patient has myeloma, to also send off uh, one tube, it doesn't take much, a sample for the fish cytogenetics and uh, so that you have it right away. Now, whether or not you're treated right away, it's another matter. If you have smoldering myeloma, it might not make a difference what your fish is because we're not going to treat you. But most of the time, we are at the point where if we know the fish right away, the minority of people have a genetic abnormality that we're really going to change um, your treatment for it. Um, but still, it, it may, would make a difference. As you saw, if you have 17P deletion, which is a high risk genetic feature, it will make us change what we do, which is more intensive therapy than the standard patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so right up, uh, up at the beginning. Yeah, that's a good question about immunotherapy and whether it's we have immunotherapy specific to myeloma or just uh, there are drugs that are used elsewhere. So what we're, uh, so let me backtrack. So when I first started treating myeloma, I almost never spoke to the colleague down the hall who tr treated melanoma because we never really had any overlap. Uh, we, we didn't have treat treatments that were similar. And what we're seeing now with more targeted treatments is that we know that a lot of the pathways or the mechanisms for cancer are the same in whatever cancer you have. So these immunotherapies, like for instance, the one I mentioned, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, it's an inhibitor to an inhibitor. Well, everyone has that inhibitor. That's part of your normal immune system. So it doesn't matter what your cancer is that developed. Uh, we want to try to enhance the, uh, your own immune system to fight off whatever cancers. So a lot of these treatments you may think of as melanoma treatments only because they were studied in that disease first, but they're very useful in all types of cancers. On the other hand, there are some immunotherapies that are very specific to myeloma, like the CAR T cell that was uh, against BCMA that I mentioned present, presented at ASH. BCMA is a, is a is a target on myeloma cells, not melanoma, not lung cancer. And so CAR T cells are kind of a generic approach, but they, they modify it so it's specific to myeloma. So it depends on, immunotherapy is a really big catch-all term right, for different types of treatments from pills to you know, CAR T cell to what, whatever. So, some of them will be modified from other cancers and some will be, uh, will be the same. Uh, now I forgot, I, I, uh, Kathy asked me at the break to make sure I discussed the difference or the, uh, um, the uh, issue of low dose versus high dose dex. So we used to use a lot of high dose dexamethasone. And that meant, and many of you remember this, and you still complain to me about being on high-dose dexamethasone, that you're on 40 milligrams, days 1 to 4, 9 to 12, 17 to 20. That's 12 days of high-dose dex, and you don't sleep at all the whole month. And uh, so that's what we used to use routinely. 
Uh, and we still use it for the first two months of your initial Cyborg D treatment, heading more towards transplant, because high dose dex works really well with these other drugs. It helps synergize, like give, make the other drugs like Velcade and Revlimid work better. And so you get a faster response. Um, so that's why we tend to use it uh, at the beginning of your treatment to give us a bit of a better oomph, especially because uh, people are often sicker at the beginning, right? So if you have kidney failure or got bad bone disease, the high dose dex will help to improve the kidney, kidneys faster, also will, um, uh, it, it actually helps with bone pain if you've got a lot of new bone lesions. So the high dose dex is helpful, but we've learned also that, um, that some people don't need that high dose dex and that in fact the, the problem with high dose dex is there are lots of side effects. So you can't sleep, you can get stomach upset, like burning in the stomach, it can predispose to infections. So there was a large trial from uh, ECOG, um, the Eastern European, um, the, sorry, the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group that looked at giving high dose versus low dose dex. The low dose dex is 40 milligrams once a week. So you're only getting four doses a month, not 12. And um, using it in combination with Revlimid uh, as their frontline treatment before transplant, so just for four cycles. And what they found was that uh, the outcomes were pretty much the same, but uh, the toxicities were less with once weekly. So we often, especially when we're using it in relapse setting, because when you relapse, you're gonna stay on this a long time, so you have to have something that's tolerable for months and months, if not years. We will often right off the bat just use weekly DEX. Uh, it's really only when your disease is really active and particularly newly diagnosed that we wanna give you a little bit of oomph to get that activity, um, get the initial activity underway. So the question is about what do you do if you need kyphoplasty now that we have limited access to it? Um, so that is a, uh, hopefully just a temporary issue at UHN because they're the, the, the radiology, the group that does kyphoplasty is working towards incorporating that into their funding budget. Um, so kyphoplasty, for those of you who might not be that familiar, is just where we, uh, if you um, have a vertebral fracture and you've squished your vertebrae, there's often pain and you've also gotten a little shorter. And so what we often use to help with the pain is you put a needle in and they blow up a balloon on the inside of the vertebrae. So it opens up the squished vertebrae and then the, you pull the balloon out and you have this space and then you put a bone cement in there. And that leads to immediate pain relief. But the other benefit is that it's kind of you know, increase your height. Because in case for many of you, well, it's not gonna make you taller than before, but at least you know that if you have lots of fractures, there's some people, even with just osteoporosis, they get kind of more hunched over and the alignment is off. Well, it can help to realign your spine a bit. But the main goal is to help with the pain control. And um, we've used it often with people who just have bad pain that we can't you know, improve with radiation or pain medications. So we're limited now because of a funding issue at UHN, our access. We've uh, committed from the myeloma group, uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but we've committed some funds from our own group to try to um, support the kyphoplasty program until it can be more established in their official budget. So. It does mean we're a lot more careful as to who we might want to do because it might be more restricted. Other centers may not have the same restrictions. So if you have uh, an oncologist at Trillium and they do them there, then you may want to get it done there. It's the same procedure. It's more that our uh, institution is just inundated with lots of other things that are priorities. Um, and it, so this kind of procedure might be better done at a local institution, but it, it won't, we're hoping, we've been working together, we've had several meetings with the p folks at UHN who actually do the kyphoplasty. So I'm hoping that it won't be something that's just not available. The question is with uh, triplets or combinations over double therapies, um, 
you know, they're, I'm going to paraphrase a bit, there, there is greater activity, but how are we going to balance that with the extra cost? And in Canada, that is a problem because uh, we're a publicly funded, uh, you know, medical system. So you can't just pay into your insurance and then just get premium treatment all the time. Um, so the governments have to try to um, strategize what treatments are the most appropriate and beneficial for patients uh, within, a restrict, within a certain budget for the population they have to be responsible for. And Ontario is always problematic because we have a lot of patients. So it's, what, it's going to be tricky because, um, and, and to date the way that our access has moved is, um, is trying to determine where, where is the best place to put a treatment and not necessarily to have three different treatments for the same population. We would love to have 20 treatments available and let us choose. Um, but that would be a very expensive system. So I, I think what we've been battling, and it's not always ideal, is that the government puts restrictions on where it's, the funding is available. And so they'll say, oh, maybe it'll say, this is only for one to three prior treatments. This is only, and this is what we have for, say, KRD is approved only for one to three prior lines. The funding might follow that same. Uh, pomalidomide is only approved right now for people who have had, you know, more than two lines. So if you have only had a transplant, you can't jump to pomalidomide. So it's, I think the system here is a, trying to um, figure out what might be a reasonable kind of step-by-step -step approach uh, and provide uh, drugs in that way. The problem with that is it kind of goes against uh, what we want for myeloma patients, where we know that even if you got Velcade at the very beginning of your treatment, you might still be sensitive to Velcade later, and we'd like to try it in a new combination. The government has to uh, say, sorry, you got it already. You're not getting it again. Um, in the past, usually if you got a drug already and you fa you're, you know, you've relapsed or failed, then it usually means you're not going to go back to it. But in myeloma, it's different because, and you probably have heard of the shifting clones uh, or the you know, clonal tides. Uh, this is a concept of myeloma having a bunch of clones. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, that if you get treated with Velcade up front, then the clones that are more sensitive to Velcade go down. Uh, and then later on, though, after you've had Revlimid and pomalidomide, maybe those early clones, because we didn't cure you, so those clones are not gone, they just got squished down, they may start to grow again, and then that Velcade-sensitive clone might be more prominent again, so we would want to try that same drug again. That kind of goes counterintuitive what, to what we used to do, which is you had it already, probably you're resistant. Um, that's not always the case. So, so your question is a good one, but it's difficult to answer because it's hard to know um, how to balance the needs of patients and physicians with the budget. And, um, you know, neither side is ever going to be happy uh, unless we go to some private payer system, you know, like in the, in the U.S. where some people have nothing and others have everything. So that's not ideal, obviously. So uh, I didn't really answer your question because I don't think there is an answer, but we're constantly battling this. And uh, hopefully as more physicians have some input into the funding, um, then they'll, the funding is not going to be completely independent of what we need for patients. Okay, so your question is, if you have an increase in your protein in your urine, but it's not clonal, what does that mean? Or, you know, so I understand what you're saying because, um, you can have your kidneys not, oh, let me backtrack. When the most common reason why you have protein in the urine uh, that's related to myeloma is that it's, it's your uh, myeloma protein coming out in the urine because your kidneys are affected and they don't work well. And the part of the myeloma protein that uh, usually gets filtered out in the urine is the light chain, okay, because it's a small protein and it comes out in the urine easily. So we see that protein come out, and if your myeloma gets treated well, then that protein will go down in your, in your urine. However, 
sometimes people get damaged kidneys. And it's not just because you have a lot of myeloma protein and peeing, you're peeing it out, but your kidneys are not working anymore. So if your kidneys don't work, they just generally don't filter protein really well. So you can all sorts of protein come out in your urine. So you can have proteins go up in your urine and it doesn't mean your myeloma is worse. Um, so that's why it's important when we check your urine that we look to see what kind of protein is there. Because you might be spilling grams of protein, but none of it is myeloma protein. And that just means there's something else wrong with your kidneys. Uh, you may have heard about a complication of myeloma called amyloid. And when patients get amyloid in their kidneys, the protein they spill in their urine is um, often uh, albumin. Albumin is not, it's just the protein that's in the blood and it just gets filtered in the, out in the urine because the kidneys get leaky with amyloid. It's not because you have lots of myeloma protein. If you had lots of myeloma protein, when we measure the urine, it would show light chains. Yeah, so if you, the question is, if you found protein in the urine and it's not light chains, can you assume that's relapse? No. Uh, that's a hard question because, as you know, when we look at relapse, we don't just look at urine, right? We look at your blood counts, we look at the protein in your blood, we look at whether your bones are worse. There's not ever one thing we just look at to see if you're progressing. So to ask me that question is hard because I can't say that just with the protein in the urine, I can tell what's going on. But typically, if you started off with a lot of light chain in your urine as part of your myeloma, and later on, that light chain's not there and it's other proteins, typically that makes me think there's something else not related to myeloma.